I'm Pastor Josh. Hi, I'm Pastor Tara, and thank you for being with us today. And we trust that this word is going to bless you today. So let's go live now to the sermon. Are we good? Was anybody here this morning? Yes, a few of you. You came back, not much on the television tonight, no? Is that what was going on? Haven't we had a beautiful time in worship? Yeah, have you enjoyed that? I was actually just sitting at the back, just soaking it all in. And, and you, you guys are blessed with amazing worship leaders, aren't you? Like, let's show them our appreciation, you know, because to be led into the presence of Jesus like that is incredible. And you just find yourself going, oh, it's okay. He's got it all, hasn't he? He's got it all. Well, listen, it's an absolute pleasure for me to be with you tonight. I've been here um, all day uh, ministering and just spending some time. And I want to encourage you. I'm going to teach you tonight. Is that okay? Now, I know on Sunday nights what we like to do is we like to kind of kick back, relax, just go. Probably in your head you might be thinking, hoping this guy doesn't speak for too long because, I don't know, You've got better things to do, okay? But let me tell you something. When you're in the presence of the Lord and we open his word, it always makes a deposit in you that will bring about good fruit. Amen? It's all about whether you can receive and you will receive and want to receive what the Lord wants to say to you tonight. And so what I thought was I was going to continue on a theme that I, I started this morning I, and who do you say I am? The question that Jesus asked his disciples and he asks us today, because how you answer that question will determine how your life goes. Because when Jesus says to you, who do you say I am? It's not to make you feel condemned or make you feel bad. It's to lead you to a greater revelation of who he is and what his grace means for you. Because the unearned, undeserved, unmerited favor of Jesus is the gospel. There is no other news tonight that I'm going to bring you. And there's no other news or no other message that will bring you life. It is only the grace of God, the finished work of Jesus, that makes any difference. And in the word it says in John 20, verse 31, this is the signature verse for, for the book that I've written. It says, these things are written that you might believe uh, that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. And that by believing, you may have life in his name. And what I said this morning was, if you want to have life in every bit of your, your existence, every bit of your life, then it begins, starts, and ends with a revelation of Jesus and his love and his grace for you. And so your job is not to try to fill your head full of information and stuff, but to let your heart expand with an understanding of who Jesus is. Because it leads you, as we've been singing tonight, it leads us to rest it leads us to a place where we go, it's all right, you've got this. You've got this, Lord. For all the things that I can't get my hands to, all the things I can't change, I've got a choice. I either stress about those things or I leave them in the hands of the one who has done it all. Amen. And so tonight, that's what we're going to talk about. I, um, I, have, a two teen I have three kids. One has just, the middle one, Hope, um, they're not here tonight. They were at the swimming pool this afternoon. Because uh, when we head back to Belfast tomorrow night, when we land, it'll be pitch black for most of the day. The rain will be hitting us sideways and uh, the wind. And it'll be cold and miserable probably until August of next year. Because that's what it's like to live in Ireland. Seriously, it's miserable. Stop complaining about the weather, South Africans. You guys have got it made. So when I said to my kids tonight, hey, do you want to come to church with me? They were like, nah. <laughs> we're at the pool having fun. Uh, with the Macaulays. We're just going to have fun with the Macaulay kids. So dad, go for it. But our 13-year-old, it's interesting. And an 18-year-old, he didn't make the trip with us because why would you want to hang out with your parents for a whole week, right? And so isn't it funny, those of us who are parents will know that, and even Penny, my wife, says this about me. Uh, man, I, I don't know about you. I have this unbelievable ability to walk into a room and not see what's right in front of me. Like almost, it's like I'm occupying a different space to the rest of the family. And so what invariably that looks like is I, I lose two things regularly. And uh, with teenagers, it's the same, isn't it? You go, uh, have you seen my mom? Where is my? And mom is like magic because she just appears from nowhere with it in her hand. And I go, how do you do it? What kind, of, what kind of voodoo is this that you have that you can just appear with stuff? Because I can walk into that room, scar it, look for it, and go, Penny, where did you put and before I even finish the sentence, she goes, your keys, your wallet, your phone. I mean, it's, it's going to be all the same things. And I go, how do, how do I miss what's right in front of me? But yet I do it every day. Isn't that right, men particularly? 
And my wife is continually cracking up with me going, honestly, Andrew, open your eyes. And I go, my eyes are open. I just don't see what you see. <laughs> and after, we've been married for 26 years, would you believe? Uh, yeah, isn't that amazing? Uh, if you're trying to age me, we got married when we were 10. And... Uh, <laughs> Oh, maybe 11, I don't know, but that's generally how old we were. We've been married for 26 years, and now, now she even, like, I don't even need to say. We have this kind of, kind of scooby sense going on where I can just walk, because I'm afraid to ask. I'm at the stage now where it's, I'm afraid to actually say, where is my... So she just walks behind me going, is this what you're looking for? I go, no, but thank you anyway, I'll take it. All right. But it's amazing, isn't it? We miss what's right in front of our noses because we are so distracted by many things. Isn't that right? We just get so distracted by stuff and people and everything else that we absolutely miss some things that are immediately obvious. And in our world today, it was just, well, it's no different to what it was like for the disciples when they were around Jesus. And so what I want to talk to you tonight is this. Uh, I'm going to give you two stories from the, the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John, as I said this morning, is all about revealing Jesus as God, as deity, as the King of Kings. It's about who he is, not necessarily about what he did, but we're gonna look at two things that he did today. And what I'm gonna do on one, I'm just gonna give you some explanation, and the other one I'm giving you gonna, gonna give you some historical context. How does that sound? And it will make the whole story go pop and make it alive. So if you've got a Bible with you, which you should do when you come to church, if you, uh, can I grab some water actually? Would that be all right? Um, just, it doesn't matter if you've drunk out of it. I trust that you don't have germs. If I fall over, you'll know it was Zia's bottle, right? What killed me? Mm. <laughs> yep. Do you have germs? No, it's okay. That's good. It's anointed Psalm 91. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> do, you know, do you know what's funny? It's not about you. I, I won't even drink out of a can that my wife's drunk out of. You know, I'm just that fussy. I just go, oh no, I'm not going to do that. Ooh. Now here's the thing. All right? In John chapter 2, we start to get into the word and Jesus performs what you might have heard is called his first miracle. And it's the story of the wedding at Cana in John 2. Now we all know the story, don't we? There's a party going on and Jesus has been invited to it. And they, they run into a problem. And the problem is that the hosts have run out of wine. Now, I don't know in South Africa how that plays, but in Belfast, that is a total disaster, okay? One thing you don't want to do is run out of Guinness or wine. And what happens is we read in this story that Jesus performs actually what we have been told is called a miracle, but the actual word means it's a sign. Now, whenever something happens for the first time in the Bible, sometimes it's called the law of first mention. Now, this is not particularly a law of first mention, but it's the first time that Jesus performs something. So the first time he ever does anything, we've got to prick up our ears and take notice because what he's saying is something way more than what we think it is, okay? There's a, a special significance here. And what he's going to do, he's going to say, look, we're going to see a basic pattern. Jesus will reveal something significant, and then he'll ask you and I to make a choice on what is revealed, and he'll say, well, who do you say I am based on what you've just seen revealed? And John actually calls this first sign, or this first encounter with Jesus a sign because its significance reveals something very special to us. So let's look at some of the details. There are six ceremonial jars here that are pulled out for Jesus to fill. You know the story, don't you? Just wave and say, yeah, okay? Now, does anyone know what the number six means in, in, in Hebrew? Seven is perfection, completion. Six is just about man, it's humanity, okay? So six just represents man, and so there are these six ceremonial jars, and it's just a picture of man, and we know this because man's created on the sixth day, etc., etc. And in this context, what it, do, it does is it represents our effort as people to get right with God and to be pleasing, our self-effort to make ourselves right with God. Now, each of these water jars, they were about this tall. They held about 30 gallons of water. And they were used by the Jews in accordance with uh, the requirements of the law that made people ceremonially, ceremonially clean. It's quite hard to say at the end of the day, ceremonially clean. Made you clean under the law, all right? Make it easy for myself. So here's the picture. The picture is we're in, we're in a bind. We're stuck. We're in a place where there is no life, there is no celebration, and we have run out of the ability to generate such. 
There is no life flowing anywhere. And there's a picture of men here filled to the brim with self-effort. Now, I don't know about you, you can drink water all day long and it will not have the same effect that one glass of wine will have on you. Not that I have ever tasted wine, but my wife tells me all the time what it's like. You can tell I'm being I'm mischievous because she's not here. I'm gonna take full advantage, okay? And so what happens is you can, you can drink water all day long it w and it will produce nothing in you. No life, no celebration, just water. And so what Jesus is gonna do in the middle of this context is, is he's gonna reveal something about the kingdom that he is just about to bring. It is a rev if I could tell this story, it'd be easy. You know, the Lord of time and space, he can take anything and turn it into something incredible. Yeah, I get all of that, but there's a deeper meaning in this story because it's the first time that Jesus ministers. And he's harking back, why, why if you, you think about it, if you were Jesus and you're gonna do the very first thing that is gonna get people's attention, what do you think you would do? Well, I've thought about this. I'm definitely going for raising the dead, okay? Like, call me cheap, but that's maximum attention. Bring in all the dead people, I'm gonna bump, 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 poof, they're gonna pop up to life, and word's gonna travel quickly. I'm not Jesus, but that's kinda of would have been my suggestion. Lord, if I wanna make a splash, get something on Instagram here, let's just go for the dead ones, because that always gets a crowd, <laughs> right? But he doesn't do that, he takes water and turns it into wine. And you kinda of go, what? Why would you do that? Well, it was in this context, Pastor. He was in, in a wedding. It wasn't. Do you know that the people at the time longed for life and freedom? The Jews at the time were so bound by the law and self-effort and trying to please God. They were under the, the oppression of the Romans, but they were also under a religious system that broke their backs. And the whole weight and tenant of Jewish history was to send the Messiah because we want to be free. And so one of the things that they understood, going all the way back to Isaiah chapter 25, let me read you the verse. On this mountain, the Lord Almighty will prepare a feast of rich food for all peoples. Now listen to this. A banquet of aged wine, the best meats and the finest of wine. So to the Jewish mind in the context of this story in Cana, whenever the Lord took water and this picture of empty like vessels, people, men, with no way of finding life and celebration and fullness and wholeness because it's just water, self-effort on the inside of them. What he says is, let me turn that on the inside of you into the finest of wine. And straight away, we don't get it, but the Jews would have got it. They would have gone, hold on. The Messiah's kingdom, one of the signs of the kingdom of the Messiah who would come and lead us into freedom would be it would be marked by the finest of wine. And so what happens here is that like, the, the, it would be a generous kingdom. The Messiah's kingdom would be full and wine was always like a, like a picture or analogy that was used for the coming kingdom of grace. And what happens then, and this is the application for us, if we go back, the Garden of Eden and that story there shows us how we as human people, human beings are deceived by the ultimate lie. Do you know what many of us believe? Many of us believe that God is holding out on us, don't we? Like, let's get honest at times. We see people around us get blessed and we go, that's brilliant, but Lord, what about me? Why is it happening for them? God, why are you holding out? Why have I not seen my breakthrough? Why have I not seen the fulfillment of the promise? What's wrong with me, Lord? Why are you holding out on me? Why are you not giving me all that I need to flourish? You know, you could call this what the world calls this, what's called a scarcity mindset. And a scarcity mindset focuses on what we don't have instead of what's been given to us. And in the, the biblical story, when humanity operates out of a distrustful scarcity, scarcity mindset, we begin to justify entirely selfish behavior. Do you know why you act selfishly at times? Because your revelation of Jesus and his generosity is too small. And we think that if God is blessing somebody else, there's not enough for him to bless me at times. And so what the Lord is, is trying to say in this story, right? I mean, his response actually to our own history of selfishness is not to condemn us, but in a reversal of expectations, he decides to give us the most generous gift, and that's the gift of Jesus. I wanna say tonight, if you find it hard to let go and you act selfishly at times, it's because your revelation of the Lord is too small. When we do not see that every need is met in the work of grace, 
then the only other option we have is to take responsibility onto our own shoulders. And then life becomes very tough. That includes your own comfort, what you think will make you feel better about yourself and your life. And actually, this is the point where we fall from grace, back to the demands of a performance faith that just results in a cycle of defeat and failure. And what happens is the Lord goes, listen, the first thing I'm going to show you and everything else, this is the point, why a generous, overflowing, abundant announcement of the kingdom? Because what he's saying is this, many of us believe that God holds out and he holds back, but whatever the area is, when Jesus is in, char is in charge, when Jesus brings his kingdom, everything about it will be abundant and overflowing everything about it. He will not hold back from you. He doesn't hold back in any way from you. And what he's saying is not just about water to wine and all that sort of stuff. He's saying in every need that you have, it will be an overabundant, overflowing flow of grace to you in your life. Do you get that? And he's trying to raise the expectation of the people that whatever their need will be, it's going to be way more than what they first thought. And that cuts right to us today. Many of us have given up on the idea, I believe, that actually what well, this kingdom that we have been brought into, the kingdom of Jesus and his grace, is an, is an overflowing, abundant kingdom. Whether it's for healing, provision, peace, security, protection, hope, or security, the Lord is not miserly. This is what he's saying. He's announcing into the, the middle of people who are in need, whatever it is, I'm going to oversupply for you. In fact, let's just have a look at this. In Exodus 7, we read the story of the first public miracle of Moses, don't we? Uh, Pharaoh's heart is hard, and so Moses turns the river Nile into blood, and many people die. But when we contrast that with Cana, we see that the new covenant of grace is so much different. Jesus turns this water into wine, and if you're wondering how much it was, it was about 840 bottles of wine. That's quite a lot. That's like half the size of Pastor Alan's cellar. You know what I mean? Like we're talking, <laughs> we're talking, a, so he tells me, he, we're talking a lot. Now, do, do you think do you, sometimes, when you look at that, there is no way that they were going to need 840 bottles. Isn't that right? I don't know. I've been to a few parties in my time, good Christian parties where you drink Coca-Cola and eat peanuts, right? But I've heard about these other parties where people drink a lot but they don't drink 840 bottles in a setting. Do you know what we would do? We would go, that's terribly wasteful. Why would he do that? How many, did he, how many people are at this wedding? Give me a list. Oh, we've got you two, four, four, couple of glasses, couple of glasses. You've had a couple, so you're getting one. Okay, I tell you what, we need 37 bottles, and that'll keep the party going. And the Lord goes, what? Just take all of that, turn it into the finest age wine, and in a moment, right? What we see as wasteful or the world would see as wasteful and extravagant, the Lord is trying to say to you, you know, in a moment in this kingdom, I will oversupply and it will never run out. Run out. What the world says is wasteful, I say is provision because of my heart of grace for you. Isn't that amazing? And the people would have been incredibly surprised. Enough for the party and enough left over. Enough to go on and keep the thing running for as long as they could ever hope for. I'm trying to tell you tonight, church, when it comes to Jesus, there are no half measures. Not only can the guests celebrate here at Cana, but there's no longer embarrassment for the host. His honor is preserved, and Jesus does this because he cares. He just doesn't want to meet our physical needs, but he knows what matters to us, and he will never see us put to shame. And that is the story of Cana. And that's where Jesus, in this book of John, after John in, in, in chapter one is gone, in the beginning was the word, and he starts to explain all this. He announces to us, raise up your heads this week. Do you wanna know what that word means for you? Lift up your heads in expectation. Where you have been disappointed and felt that God has held out for you, he says, go to my word, and this, this was written so that you might believe that you might believe that I am the Messiah and the mark of my kingdom as the Messiah is overabounding generosity to the point that the world will say it's wasteful and the Lord says, come and try me. That's just the tip of the iceberg of the way that I wanna love you, look after you, care for you and provide for you. Amen. I don't know what your need is. I don't know where it sits. But for me, you know, I run a business as well as run a church. And, uh, you know, everywhere we look at times, we just see lack, don't we? 
we kind of we kind of measure our lives sometimes in terms of what we don't have or what we still need and what we're, what we're missing. And ah, sometimes I just get so darn tired of that. And I say, and the Lord brings me back to this story and says, can you just meditate for a while on what you have been brought into? What kingdom are you in? Who is the king of your kingdom? Is he a tight-fisted, miserable God who just meets out exactly what you need? Or is it because he owns it all, holds it all, has it all, and in a moment can transform any situation, will just pour into you, Andrew? Will pour into your church? Will pour into your business? Will pour into your life? What are you believing for? And the Lord said, I, I keep getting reminded, hey, church, this kingdom is a generous kingdom. And it's not just about wine, it's about healing. It's about provision. It's about safety. It's about hope. It's about good mental health. It's about your family. It's about your businesses, your schools. It's about your church and your ministry. Whatever it is you need, it is oversupplied for you tonight. All you have to do is say, yes, Lord, I receive. You know, Pastor Prince taught us many years ago, whenever you stop working, the Lord works. But if you want to work, then the Lord rests. That really struck me many years ago and I struggled with it because I was like, Lord, I'm just trying to help you out. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, cut this Irish guy a break. I'm trying my best here. Have you ever said that to the Lord? Seriously, I'm trying my best. Cut me some slack, meet me halfway. The Lord goes, meet you halfway. I went way beyond like before you even took breath, Andrew, I went way beyond for you. There's no halfways when it comes to me. I go to the furthest parts of death and hell for you to redeem you back, place you here so that you can receive grace upon grace in your life. I don't meet you halfway, the Lord says, so stop trying and just start trusting. Because if you can learn to live in a rhythm of rest, that's not laziness. Rest is spirit-directed activity. As he opens the doors and the opportunities, you step right into them and walk through and you will see an abundance and a harvest that you could never do with your human hands as the Lord goes before you. Do you believe it? See if you believe that word today and you say, Lord, I have been living scarcity, thinking scarce here. Then just say to the Lord, I leave it down and I trust that in this area of my life, right now, you're oversupplying for me. And I'm gonna walk into that in this week, this month to come. Do you wanna give that an amen? So let's build on this. Is this okay? Are we enjoying ourselves? Yeah. I like the five o'clock card. You're way better than that card this morning. Let me tell you. They were, they were hard work. I'm only kidding. I love them. All right. So let, let's tie this in because it's interesting that I've, I've got this bottle of water because the next story I want to look at builds on, on John chapter two. It's actually flicking your Bibles to John chapter seven because Jesus is going to talk about people who are thirsty people who are thirsty, and, he say, and he's gonna say some really famous verses, but what I wanna do is I wanna, I wanna set it into context for you, is that okay? Do you mind me teaching you for a little bit? Because the, this story just pops when you, when, when you see the, what actually is going on, because Jesus is outrageous at times. He cares little for the religious tradition and what is normal in the day. He just breaks it all down and says, look, everything that you do, the Jews at the time had four main institutions that they built their life around. And there was the temple as an example and all this kind of stuff. And, the, and everything that, you know, the temple was just the place where heaven met earth. And Jesus goes, well, that's me. And he then talks about, you know, the river of life from Ezekiel flowing out. Uh, he meets the teacher of Israel and he describes to, to Nicodemus about how he is, you know, has to be born from above water and spirit. So what Jesus does is he basically dismantles all the things that, that religious people build their life around all the traditions, all the, the stuff that, and he just goes, it's all about me. It's all about me. Do you not see it? What's right in front of your face? Can you not see it? So let's, let's look at this story. You know, we, um, there's, in the last couple of weeks, there's been that horrible terrorist atrocity in Israel. And it happened on the 7th of October. Well, it, it, that was not by, um, and we pray for Israel, and we pray for those people who've, who've suffered and, and, and suffered loss. But it wasn't by accident that the, the date of the seventh was chosen because the fest, there was a festival that finished on the 6th of October this year and it was called the Festival of Sukkot or the Festival of Booths. And it was a, it's a national holiday. And in John chapter seven, they were celebrating the same holiday. 
And Jesus talks about if you're thirsty, come to me. So on, on Shabbat a couple of weeks ago, on the 6th, the, the festival actually finished. And what happens is this festival of Sukkot occurs after harvest. Now listen to me. And, it, and, and it's after the harvest has been completed and the, before the beginning of a new agricultural year. And so the picture of this and what, what happens even in Israel is they, it's almost like they take a rest from one's labor and they rejoice in what God has done to provide for his people. So in, the, in this festival, the Jews are called upon to remember God's providential care and how he cared for people after they were released from bondage from Egypt. And they're called to remember for his provision over 40 years in the desert. That's what it's about. Now, that's why God commanded them, and that's why Jews today still observe this festival. And what, the, what you'll see this on the news, they, they, they were told to leave their, their homes and to travel in Sukkot. And they're like little tents. And you'll see like, like very Orthodox Jews kind of walking around with tents around them. You might have seen them, you're probably like, what the heck's that about? Well, it was to remind them that, you know, it was as they left the, 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 the uh, Egypt and went to the promised land, they, they left permanent dwellings and they traveled in these temporary booths called Sukkot. And so it's a reminder that God, every year they remind themselves that God had re has released them or released their, their forefathers. And so God instituted Sukkot as a reminder that dependence upon him was not something that ended when they entered the promised land, when it was reached. Even after a good harvest, they had to remember year after year that it was just temporary and they had to ultimately re rely on God to provide. And so it's in this context that Jesus says something to you and me that will change your life. It will absolutely change your life. Do you want to read about it? It's amazing. Turn to John chapter 7 with me. Because what we do is we see in the, in the middle of this incredibly important festival, Jesus drops the biggest bombshell. I mean, he tears the place up. And he causes an absolute riot. Now, the priests had many duties each day. So on the first morning of Sukkot, what they would do is they would, there would be a procession of priests and they would all go down to the Pool of Siloam. You've heard of that? Okay, so the pool of Siloam is where people got healed and stuff like that. And they would bring up to the temple a golden container of water that was sufficient to last throughout the full seven days of the feast. Now, there's not a detail wasted. It's in John chapter 7, verse 37, it says this. There is on the last day of the feast, the great day. Now, there's not one detail wasted in the word. Let me tell you what this means for you. This was the climax of the festival, and it was called the libation or the water pouring ceremony. And it all took place in the temple square about a quarter of a mile by a quarter of a mile, and it would have been rammed with people, absolutely chock-a-block with people, just a quarter of a mile square. Take that as an analogy, if you like, for the crowd today, for people today. Now, the priests, like I said, they go down to the pool of Siloam, they fill up with water in this big golden, golden, uh, uh, jug, and as they're, they're walking, they sing the words of the Halal Psalms. That's Psalm 113 through to Psalm 118. And the words of that are, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That's the, so what they have is they're, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They're, they're crying out for the Messiah. And that scripture is called the welcoming cry of the Messiah from Psalm 118. And so what the, it's what the crowd are going to sing one week later when Jesus comes into Jerusalem in John 12, 13. But I'll come back to that. So they're singing the words of this prayer, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And at the same time, the priest would mutter, send the rain, send the rain, send the rain. Because under the law, even though they had been blessed for a year, they had no guarantee for their future. So as they're drawing water, they're still saying, send the rain, Lord. Don't forget us, send the rain. They were just wanting deliverance. So a few things are going on here. They're thanking God for delivering them. They're thanking God for their harvest. Uh, and harvest, as you know, is a metaphor for redemption and a foreshadow of the ultimate redemption of Jesus. And at the same time, they're believing that for their future because rain was life and with no rain, they would be dead. But there's also something deeply spiritual going on. And this is where Jesus is gonna speak to us tonight. Let me explain it to you. What happened as they, as they walked along going, God, send the rain. It's like what you and I do. Like, will you send the rain? Will you please make sure that I don't do without? 
will you please make sure that I have enough? Like I'm drawing here, but I'm still not sure that it's enough. Do you get that? Because even though I might have some life in my hands, I'm, my heart is not convinced that how you blessed me yesterday might carry on to tomorrow. Do you get that? Do you ever feel like that? And so even in the process, they're saying, oh, just don't forget us, Lord. Don't forget me. Just send, send some rain for me. And what happens is this. The priest on duty, now this is, this is awesome. He pours the contents of two big redemption bowls, okay? They're made of silver. And he pours the water. One, one was, would hold the water and the other would hold wine. And as they poured out the water, it was an, a, an expression of dependence upon God. Please send rain. And so what you have is two bowls of redemption, one with the blessing of God, water, and one with red wine. What's it a picture of? It's a picture of Jesus. Where else do we see this happen? Water and, and, and wine red being poured out. It's on Jesus' side of the cross. Blood and water will flow for the redemption of the whole world. So they have these two silver bowls of redemption, and they're pouring it out, but they don't know it's a picture of Jesus who's standing right in their midst. They're so busy with all of their religiosity and trying and performance, and God, don't forget me, they can't see that he's right there. Do you, I do that. I get so busy and so caught up, and will you, and the Lord is, is and I'm doing all the stuff, and I'm coming to church, and I'm praying, and I'm tithing, I'm giving it all that, but at the same time, my heart is going, oh God, don't forget me. Don't break through, and if you think about this generous kingdom, the Lord's just gonna build on that now and go, do you not know that it's me? Because look at what happens. The last day, these priests circle the altar seven times, a picture of perfection and completion. And then they'll take this water and they'll pour it out with great pomp and ceremony. And they'll shout, Hoshiana, okay, which simply means, Lord, save us now. And this is again what the crowd will see at Jesus' triumphal entry one week later. Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Let me apply this for you. There are many people, even in this church, who are fervently searching for God. You're looking for hope. You're looking for future. You're looking for blessing. You're looking for everything that you need in the kingdom that you have been brought into, and, but you're not understanding that it's right in front of your nose. We get so busy putting our faith in what we do that we miss Jesus right in our midst. Do you get that? It's exactly what they were doing. Now let's have a look at this. Let's read it. On the last day of the feast, John 7, 37, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. You see, they're pouring everything out. They're trying all their hard work. They're just you know, missing the hope, but they're just so fervent about it, and God, will you do? And he says, you're thirsty, aren't you? You have a need that hasn't been met. You're still not satisfied. Through all of this work, and no matter what the blessing has been, and you're thanking me for it, you're not sure for tomorrow. And so you're still thirsting. And he stands up in the middle of it all, in this quarter mile square that is rammed with people, probably like 12 to 15,000 people, like it all stood shoulder to shoulder. And he says, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. That's outrageous. This is the religious system of the day, pouring out and trying hard and doing all the rest of it. And Jesus stands up and goes, no, no, no. Are you thirsty? Then come to me. I'm the one who's gonna satisfy you. Let me see what he says. Whoever believes in me, the scripture said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. And he said this about the spirit with whom he believed in him were to receive. For as yet, the spirit had not been given because Jesus had not been glorified. Basically, he stands up and says, see in the middle of it all, it's me you're looking for. You don't want the system. You don't want the effort. You don't want the hard work. If you are thirsty, come to me, and in me you will be satisfied. I'm what you need. It all comes from me. There's no other source. It's not your education. It's not your qualification. It's not your, your bank balance. It's not your family, your reputation, your effort, or anything else. All of that will exhaust you and leave you thirsty. And this picture is amazing of religion and the law and self-effort and performance going on all around us all the time, in us, around us, part of us. And Jesus is standing in the middle of your life tonight going, see all your effort. It's all about me anyway. 
Will you just come to me instead of going through all the pomp and circumstance and then you will be satisfied? Do you know why? Because when I come to you, my kingdom is a generous kingdom. My kingdom is an overflowing kingdom. My kingdom is one which never ends, which never fails, which never runs out. Whatever your need is, I have supplied it X times more than you will ever be able to fathom. So it is me, come to me. But you know what many of us do? We go on it in a million. We get caught up in the pomp of it all. I'm doing this, pastor. I'm doing that. I'm trying that. I'm helping, the, helping Jesus out here. And he says, stop with that. It was all about me anyway. All of these are this is all pictures of me. But if you just come to me, I'm, I'm right in front of you. Do you not see it? He does this with light as well when he says, I'm the light of the world. Completely wrecks another festival, right? That's brilliant. He just, Jesus just goes around wrecking people's expectations of things. And they're all, all busy for the Lord and all busy doing this. And he goes, it's all about me. You know, as these, I'm going to start in, round up here. There was, they were looking to their future and they were saying, send the rain. Lord, will you send the rain? Have you prayed that recently? Send your provision, Lord. Give me some hope, Lord. Give me some breakthrough, Lord. And what the Lord is saying is this, you now live in the rain. There's a future aspect here to the festival of booths. The word that the Greeks used to translate tabernacled with us was a word that they had borrowed actually it was shekinah where god's glory and presence would dwell with them and what happens now this rain this water of life is actually god's presence with us now and it's flowing freely to you right now because you're loved it's because of his gift of grace completely unearned undeserved unmerited flowing over you right now and and jesus says this my flow over your life never stops. The question is, will you drink from me first? You have a choice here tonight. You can go out into your world tomorrow with everything that you've got to face, with everything that's going on for you. And you can either go, Lord, I hear what you're saying, but I'm going to take a whack at this. And if I get stuck, I'll let you know. That's kind of colloquial language, isn't it? Only when we hit the roadblocks and the limitations do we turn. But the Lord says, remind yourself tonight as you start this week that this, your position today is in a place of abundance. And you say, but pastor, I don't see it. Well, why don't we stop trying to help the Lord with that which he's already provided and start to live in faith for righteousness and trust that all things will flow. I said it this morning, using faith for things is absolutely the, as Pastor Prince taught us many years ago, it's the, the least use of your faith. You don't need faith for things, you need faith for righteousness. Because you know when the enemy comes to you, he will attack you and cause you to doubt in the goodness of God. That's it. He can't take anything from you, he doesn't have the power to do it. But what he can do, he'll come to you like he did way back in the garden and say, did God really say? Did God really say he would provide? Did God really say he would heal? Did God really say? And he just starts to undermine and we fall for it all the time, but his, his methods have never changed because he's not a creative being. He's one that usurps and takes and twists. And so when the promise of God comes, right? I'll tell you where your battle's gonna be tomorrow morning. Did he really mean that? Did God really say that? And I wanna encourage you to go to the word because it was written that you might believe that he is the Messiah and in believing you will have life. Let me tell you something, when God moves that way in your life, it undoubtedly, undoubtedly, things are different. Let me leave you with this one verse. I started to meditate on this and I thought, I have lived so much of my life thirsty. Going around the same flipping mountain time and time again, going, when will I learn? Walking in, like, like I said, like my wife going, it's right in front of you. Just open your eyes to see it. Open your eyes to see that Jesus is right in front of you. And he's there saying, have a look at what this kingdom is like. It's fully generous. It's full. Jeremiah 17, let me finish with this. It says this. This is what it's like to live with the water of life flowing in you. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose trust is in the Lord. He's like a tree planted by water that sends out 
roots by the stream and does not fear when the heat comes. For its leaves remain green and it's not anxious in the year of doubt, for it does not cease to bear fruit. Isn't that beautiful? Do you know, I'm just gonna finish with this if I can. Do you know when the Lord writes things like that? Do you know that faith, faith in you is related to the power of your imagination? Oh, I wish I could teach this. In the Bible, Jesus, the way we're designed is that the Lord paints things in pictures so that we can see it. And that's what causes faith to rise. That's why we have these analogies that even in a year of doubt, I'll remain green. Green is a Ranan in Hebrew, the word green in Hebrew, Ranan was the first press of the olive that was used to anoint the kings. It's a picture of grace, right? And so when it says the leaves remain green, it's not just that they're nice and flowery. What it means is that like even in drought, you will remain full of grace anointed by Jesus. And that will cause you, what does it say? Ranan will be, you will not cease to bear fruit. That's the word of God for you. So what, why does the Lord paint that picture for you? Because as you start to imagine it and you start to picture it, close your eyes for me right now. And you say, pastor, we don't do this. We don't picture stuff. Well, you do picture stuff all day long. It's just normally negative. This is gonna go wrong. That's gonna go wrong. And the Lord says, you're gonna be like a tree planted by water, your roots going down deep, receiving grace and never ceasing to bear fruit. You'll stop being thirsty. I pray that over everyone in this place tonight. I pray that you would see yourself as that tree planted deep tonight. Deep roots going into the generous heart of God, into the generous kingdom of God. I pray over every home over every individual, over every child in business. I speak fruitfulness over you. I speak increase over you. I speak to this week that you would be surprised by the grace and the glory of God as you stop from the effort and the work, the self-promotion, the hustle. And Jesus says, stop and come to me because this kingdom is a generous kingdom. You will be oversupplied as you draw from me you will see your thirst satisfied. We don't need to say, Lord, send the rain. You're living in the rain of God's blessing, pouring out on you every day. And it's the heart of faith tonight that reaches and says, yes, Lord, I receive this word. I may be looking with my natural eyes and seeing lack, but Lord, I refuse to believe that that is the final story. Let your declaration of faith tonight be, Lord, even though I can't see it, I believe that you're working. Even though I can't feel it, my feelings are not the truth. Your word is the truth. And your word was written so that I might believe and that in believing I would have life. Turn your heart and your attention to the one who's in your, in your midst every day. Lift up your eyes and look into his tonight into that beautiful gaze of grace, to be held in that grasp of grace as he ministers into your heart right now. Whatever it is, I've oversupplied. Believe and rest and you will see that good fruit. Jesus, let that word settle over your church tonight, that for this week we release your people into rest into a deeper revelation of this generous kingdom, into a deeper understanding of your work. And for the people who are thirsty tonight, who are saying, Lord, send the rain, I pray that right now, that river of life, that river of your grace, Lord, would flow and flow and flow and flow and flow, and they would be overtaken this week by the goodness, the blessing, and the favor of Jesus himself. And all God's people said, Amen. Thank you. How amazing. How good was that? Thank you so much, Pastor. This is Pastor. That was such a good teaching. Such a good word, right? Amen. I want us to stay in that atmosphere. And I'm just going to ask that you guys just all, all of us in the room, just close our eyes. So we heard about this these two miracles, two things that Jesus did in the book of John. 
But if you're in this room tonight and you don't know Jesus personally, it's amazing hearing what He's done. It's amazing hearing stories and reading even in the word of him. But we've got to know him ourselves. He's a personal God. He's a personal God. And the father sent his only son to die for us. A personal God. If you were the only one alive, he would still have sent Jesus to die for you to die for me and if you don't know Jesus tonight if you don't have that relationship with him I want to invite you to do a basic thing it's like an ABC number one we acknowledge that we need a savior you don't need to do anything right now by lifting up your hand or coming to the front just with all your eyes closed, right where you're sitting, you can acknowledge. If you've never invited Jesus to be your Lord, to be your Savior, and called on His name, right now you acknowledge that, right? We acknowledge, Jesus, that we need you. We acknowledge, Jesus, that we need a Savior. And then the B is just believe. We believe in our hearts. The word says you, you just believe in your heart. Believe in your heart and you will be saved. I'm going to add a C. Are we going to confess? And you don't have to do it alone tonight. Everyone in the room, I'm going to ask that you pray after me. And this is not a moment where I want to invite you to accept Jesus as your Savior if you already have him as your Savior. If you're saved, you are saved. If you accepted him, you are born again. You don't have to be born again time and time again. But may you tonight be reminded of your righteousness and of your assurance of salvation. But if you want to pray that tonight for the very first time, because I know there's someone in this room that wants to accept Jesus, I'm going to ask that everyone prays after me right now. Say, Father God, thank you so much that you sent Jesus to die on the cross for me. Jesus, tonight I acknowledge that I'm in need of you and I believe in my heart so I know I'm saved. I accept you as my Lord, as my Savior tonight. I am born again. I'm a child of God. Amen. Amen. If you prayed that prayer tonight for the first time, can we give the, those people a hand? If you're here in this room, congratulations. It's amazing. And we have a team who would love to give you some resources after the service right outside that door where you can go and meet them. But tonight... If you pray that prayer for the first time, all of heaven is literally rejoicing right now. It's incredible. It is the best decision that you have ever made in your life. And your life is about to change because you have eternal life right now. Amen. I want us to partake in communion next as we stay focused on the finished work of Jesus. Rest in the finished work of Jesus, continuing in that as Pastor Andrew preached. If you don't have any communion elements, you can just raise your hand. One of our hosts will help you. You're welcome to stand or stay seated as well during this, whatever is the most comfortable for you. But these elements, they speak of the finished work of Jesus. We don't need to do anything. He's died on that cross for us. He's done it all for us. You know, the Israelites, when they were partaking in Passover, they ate the head. <laughs> and tonight, as we as you even see that picture, as they're eating the bread, or the, the lamb's head, 
this bread that represents the body of Jesus, it speaks of our mental well-being that we have, wholeness. If you're struggling with forgetfulness, insomnia, whatever in your mind, wholeness, that's what we partake of tonight. They also, also partook of the leg of the lamb. It speaks of the rest of our body. He didn't die without any sicknesses being pinned to that cross. He didn't die saying, I don't want to take cancer. I don't want to take this. I don't want to take that. So that you can carry it on your body. No. It's all pinned to that cross. And tonight as this cracker is broken, we remember what he did on the cross. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for wholeness from the crown of our heads to the soles of our feet. This speaks of our healing and it speaks of our provision in you. Let's receive. And this juice that represents the blood of the lamb. It's the blood of the lamb that was shed for us. It speaks of our righteousness and our forgiveness. It washed us white as snow. The moment we accepted Jesus as our Lord and as our Savior, you need to keep on doing it. But you've got to keep on reminding yourself that you are righteous and that He took it all because we are. So, it's so easy for us to take it on ourselves. Pastor Andrew spoke about it tonight. We don't need to do anything but be reminded that it is finished, all of it. And when the Father looks at us, He sees us as white as snow, forgiven, righteous because of this blood. Let's receive. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for joining us today. We trust that the sermon blessed you. If it touched you, why not share it with someone? And if you want more words like this in the future, why not subscribe to our page? Until then, we'll see you next time. See you next time.